I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and Hogwash is back! Alright, future me, I know you thought this joke would be funny, but really it's just really obnoxious. No one cares. Nobody's watching. No one cares. Stop. It's, it's just so annoying. In the past, we've talked about the Weeping Angels on Doctor Who, we've talked about Wasp and her significance in the Ant-Man movie, we're going to be talking about Kylo Ren's helmet, we're going to be talking about possible justifications for why people just keep on rebuilding the Death Star. But today, we're going to be talking about Alolan Marowak. And there's a very, very good reason for that. The main reason is that Pokemon Sun and Moon are going to be released in Europe on the 23rd of this month, and I would like to capitalize on that to get as many likes, views, and shares as possible. Not that that's necessarily going to work. I've, I've tried stuff like this before. It didn't pan out well. Hello darkness, my old friend. The other reason is because, well, I've noticed something very, very interesting about Alolan Marowak that makes it stand out from all of the other Alolan forms and completely changes the way I look at Marowak. In the Pokemon games, you play as a 10-year-old child who drops out of society to become a dog-fighting hobo. This is such an accepted and crucial form of the society of the Pokemon world that most of the culture and economy of the Pokemon world are built around these dog-fighting hobos. Of course there are people who enter their captured wild animals into grooming contests, talent shows and the like, but chiefly it's about the dog fighting. In fact there's even a league set up for dog fighting hobos to decide who is the world's best dog fighting hobo, and most of the world's problems are solved by dog fighting hobos. They're, it's a really weird set of games when you Pokemon are essentially the animals of their world, and unlike the animals in our world, nearly all of them, actually no, not nearly, all of them are capable of tool use. How do I know that? Well, the existence of held items. The items in the game that Pokemon can hold that they will use in battle. The fact that every Pokemon can use held items suggests that all Pokemon can at least be taught tool use. They at least have the intellectual capacity to be taught how to use tools. But there are a few standout Pokemon that are able to use tools in the wild without being taught by humans without any form of human intervention. Now of course there's lots of examples of these. There's uh, Kadabra, Alakazam, Farfetch'd, uh, Timber, Girder, Conkelder, and a bunch more from generations that I'm less familiar with. But the two most well-known examples of tool-using Pokémon are Cubone and Marowak. Now, they stand out because they're, they're Gen 1 Pokémon and their tools get very much used as part of their battle strategy, unlike Kadabra and Alakazam's spoons, which seem to be almost more of an accessory, Cubone and Marowak very much make use of the bone that they carry. Apart from that, Cubone and Marowak actually have two examples of tool use, not just one. Why two? Well, the skull they wear on their heads, while more of an accessory than a tool, still suggests tool use, and I'll show you why. This is a crow skull. Now if you look at the underside, you'll see that there is still bone there. There is no direct opening into the brain cavity. There's an awful lot of bone in the way. Most skulls would be constructed like this, so you wouldn't be able to just find a skull and plonk it on your head to wear as a helmet. You would have to remove layers and layers of bone in order to get in there. You would have to clear it out, carve it, and having worked in bone before, that can take a long time without power tools. That can take hours without power tools. 
And that is what Cubone would have had to do to wear its mother's skull as a helmet. So what tool did it use? Well, the bone that Cubone carries differs from the bone Marowak carries. Marowak seems to be carrying a complete femur, which would make a better club than Cubone's bone. Cubone's is long and tapered and sharp on one end, and that doesn't look naturally occurring. And if it's a bone, presumably from its mother, there would be no reason for a bone like that to exist in a Marowak's body. That looks more like it was done intentionally, which suggests that Cubone sharpened that bone, probably using a rock or maybe another piece of bone or something else. Whatever it used, that's using a tool to make a tool. That's a kind of behavior we almost never see in our world in creatures that aren't humans. There's some evidence that corvids might be doing it and maybe some primates, but it's very rare even in creatures that do exhibit tool use. So not only do Cubone and Marowak use their bone as a tool, Cubone used a tool to make its tool. So that's two examples of tool use. But looking deeper into Cubone's wearing of the skull and carrying of the bone, that smacks of ritual, of tradition or custom. Cubones don't just pop out of the egg wearing their mother's skull. Okay, they do, but you know what I mean. The eggs aren't really eggs, they're, they're cradles. There are parts of Pokemon lore that just don't make sense. But they have to put that on. They have to do the work to do that. Which suggests an element of culture to the behavior of Cubone and Marowak. You can't have traditions without culture. So what does all this have to do with Alolan Marowak? Well, to explain that, I'm going to have to look at the difference in another Alolan form and its normal form. We'll take a look at Alolan Executor. Alolan Executor has a much longer neck. It has an additional head, a tail, with the additional head on it, and it has the dragon typing instead of psychic. The reason given for this on the Pokemon website is that the Executor and Alola get more sunlight and are therefore able to grow larger, which makes sense. But these are all very biological differences, they're very physiological differences. It's definitely a difference in how Executor's body developed, in how its body is built and structured. Let's look then at the difference between Marowak and Alolan Marowak. The first differences that jump out at me here are the fact that Alolan Marowak's bone is on fire and the marking on Alolan Marowak's forehead. However, the bone is not a part of Alolan Marowak. It is not a biological, physiological difference. That is the tool that Alolan Marowak is using. And looking at the Pokemon website, it says that it lights that bone on fire by rubbing it against its forehead using friction to light it. Like a human would. That mark on Alolan Marowak's forehead is probably a mark from rubbing the bone. Not only that, but that's not really Alolan Marowak's forehead. That's the forehead of the skull Alolan Marowak is wearing. So again, that's a difference on Alolan Marowak's tools, not on Alolan Marowak. Next difference is the coloration, but shiny Pokemon already exist. If shiny Marowak isn't different from ordinary Marowak because of its coloration, then that's not a big enough difference to distinguish Alolan Marowak from Marowak. The last, final, and most subtle difference is that Alolan Marowak is more gaunt, more thin and lithe, whereas Marowak is more stocky, almost chubby. Uh, you may think that the fact that Alolan Marowak is a fire type, whereas ordinary Marowak is a ground type, is grounds enough for saying there has been a physiological change. But it seems that Alolan Marowak 
didn't develop a fire gland, no part of its body suddenly became on fire. It developed a method of creating fire with its tools. Again, like a human would. That difference is cultural, it's, it's technological. Fire is a very basic form of technology, but it's still technology. Being able to create fire is technology. So the fire typing still isn't really a physiological difference between lowland Marowak and Marowak. What about the ghost typing? One thing you have to remember is that Marowak is a Pokemon that has always skirted on the edge of ghost type. The fact that it wears its own mother's skull, the fact that it uses a bone, probably again its mother's, as a weapon, the fact that it is called the Bone Keeper Pokemon. In Generations 1 and 2, you find it near Lavender Town, an area heavily associated with ghosts and ghostly activity. And finally, the only time in the Pokemon games where you get to battle a ghost that isn't explicitly a ghost-type Pokemon is when you fight Cubone's dead mother in the Pokemon Tower of Lavender Town, the Marowak that Team Rocket killed. So what gave Alolan Marowak that final push into making it a ghost type? If we look at the Pokemon website again, it says that Alolan Marowak started dancing with the bone and the fire. And I think that might be our answer. In a lot of cultures, rhythmic music with a strong drum beat and, and dance are both heavily connected with meditation, with spiritual journeying. I think it's very possible that Alolan Marowak's addition of dance and fire dancing to its culture helped to establish a connection to the spirit world. Especially considering that the bones it was using as part of its dance most likely came from its mother, its ancestors. It established a connection with the spirit world. It got in contact with spirits and ghosts through its dancing. Which could also explain why Alolan Marowak's fire is that ghostly green colour. Through its communing with spirits, it began to see more about the world around it. So what would all of this mean? This would mean that Alolan Marowak's chief differences with ordinary Marowak are all technological and cultural, rather than physiological. It would separate it from all other Alolan forms as being the only one to develop its difference along cultural and technological lines rather than physiological, biological lines. And that would make Marowak, the Marowak species, not only the most human kind of Pokemon, but arguably the most intelligent. Do you also want a pair of desiccated hands with flaming fingertips grasping for your nipples, then go to my red bubble shop. You can get more of this and a bunch of other weird crap and, you know, just be helpful. So click here to go to my red bubble shop.